I'd like to welcome everybody here to the meeting. I'm sorry for the uh, uh, kind of the delayed opening and everything. Uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Britt with us. Uh, he's going to be uh, teaching us some exciting things about uh, photography inside your house with stills. And this particular meeting has taken a lot of uh, practice and everything, mostly on Britt's end, but on us uh, also for technology-wise with Zoom, because Britt has got not only his uh, uh, webcam that's part of his laptop, but also he's got two cell phones that he's using as video cameras. And so the amount of tinkering and everything that we had to do to make that happen without uh, sound and everything getting all wonky and, and stuff, uh, we were able to get that nailed down in about two meetings that we had separately. And so all that was set up and we were good to go for this evening. And then we found that uh, nobody could log in. And to be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure why that happened, um, but we decided to punt and kick that old meeting to the uh, side and send out a whole new link. And it looks like we've got a pretty good uh, reach. I, actually, I think we've got a bigger number of people signed in now uh, than we have on previous meetings that have gone well. So maybe this should be a model for us going <laughs> forward. Uh, we'll change it up on you guys at the last minute and push out a, a last minute reminder. So uh, anyway, I apologize for any uh, technical difficulties. I'm sorry that we're kicking this off an hour later than normal, uh, but I'm, I'm Super happy to see everybody here. Uh, just uh, some housekeeping items here real quick before we get going. I, again, I muted everybody. That's just to get everybody's uh, background noises and stuff turned off. If you feel like you want to uh, unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, but uh, we're going to ask that you hold your questions as, as far as uh, not speaking them uh, and not interrupting uh, Britt. If you do have a question at any time, you can click on your chat window and type your question into the chat window. And then Rick is going to be our, uh, well, we'll just call him Vanna, I guess, for tonight. Uh, he, he, will, uh, he will be recording your messages down and everything. And then at the appropriate times when either Britt says, okay, I'm ready for some questions, or if there's a pause, or it seems you know, this is the right time, Rick will ask those questions. And then at the very end, we'll open it up all, you know, so everybody can talk uh, and ask Britt, you know, some questions. But we've been doing this for uh, a, a little while now, and, and this seems to work out okay. So, okay. I don't want to waste any more of your time, and I'd like for us to get on with uh, talking to Britt. And so, Britt, uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Uh, I know that most of the people here already do know you, but I think that we may have a few people who do not. So I'm going to turn it over to you, sir, and, and uh, uh, thanks for being here. No, I just wanted to make you nervous. No, I, did. <laughs> I put my thumb over the camera. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we, we can okay, all hear you. Good. You're good. I, was, I was just being silly. I thought I'd give you a little heart attack. Hi, yeah, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, uh, first, thanks to the coordinators who worked on trying to get this done. We're trying something different. It's a three camera technique, so you'll be able to see what's going on. One of the cameras is right behind me here. It's my phone. Uh, actually, that's my wife's phone. And then there's another one, which is an overview, which is over in the corner, so you can see what's going on. This camera right here, the little one that you see pointing to the flower in the vase, it is not uh, uh, the perspective you would normally have with your camera because a uh, uh, extreme wide angle is what you get on the phone. But it's gonna give you a pretty good idea of what this lighting and how this thing's gonna work. Greg's gonna go back and forth as I talk about something. He's gonna switch the camera view. The goal is, is to try to give you an idea to see the uh, the setup as a whole, and then get some idea of what it would look like if you were actually making the photograph. In doing this, I'm going to be talking about the methods that I use at home because I don't want to go to a lot of trouble to make a still life. So I just use things from the garage and around the kitchen and around the house uh, as my 
tools. There's no fancy equipment here. I don't have any big lights. The light that you see coming in from behind, that big star, that burst of light, is simply a shop LED broad work, work light that I got for working in the garage when it's dark or some project at home. I'm gonna be using flashlights and, and, uh, and very simple items. So what I hope you can do after watching this is to feel comfortable about trying to do tabletops at home, recognizing that you now know that you probably have everything that's needed at your house. I've got a variety of things that I use which help me out. Uh, for example, on a, I used a sticky poster putty to hold things in place. And I use thread. Now let's look up towards the ceiling. You see that piece of tape up there? That little blue dot? If I'm gonna have a plant or something, I will <laughs> use thread and it's taped up to the ceiling and it'll help my still life hold up. And because I last used a green subject, I use some green thread and then it makes it, and then I Photoshop the whole thing out. I use a variety of different clips to hold things together. Uh, whatever I get around, I can't, I've used a lot of these types of paper clips, uh, the really big size and the really small size to help hold things together. Um, I use clothespins. So anything that'll hold is all you need. Clothespins I use most often when I'm using a, uh, something that is very vertical. And I'll put a couple of clothespins together, holding that vertical item up. And sometimes I can do that without having to thread up in the ceiling. A lot of what I do when I'm working is to use a little flashlight. And I use a little flashlight and I tape something on one side so that when I am using the flashlight, I'm not shining into the lens and degrading the image. And I don't have any problem with flare that way. And so if I decide that I'm going to actually do light painting, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, that's something that Carol does a lot of, I don't want the actual light shining in towards the camera. Instead, I want it only visible on my subject or on the background. So that's why I use this. Sometimes I use two or three of them. I'll set one up and I'll use some of the putty again to give me a little light in the spotlight. So the idea here always is that if you take the things that you have around the house, you can get the photographs done. For example, this is one of my favorite little reflectors, aluminum foil. Does a great job in adding a little specular light or helping me move light around. All the boards that I use are simple foam core boards that you can order online now. You, know, you probably used to go to the art supply store and pick them up. But I have a, a variety of different foam core boards. I even have science project boards that come in different colors. And I can use those for background with a narrow depth of field so that if I have like a, and I'll show you a bright yellow background uh, from a science fair board, which everybody can get, if I throw it out of focus, it makes a beautiful bright yellow when I shine a light on it. So that's what our goal is. And that's what some of the tools are that we're gonna be doing. Um, I encourage you to get online and look up tabletop photography or uh, food photography. I posted some sites um, on the uh, club's Facebook page so you can take a look at it. There's a guy I like a lot named uh, David, let me look at his last name, Loftus. He's just an extraordinary food photographer. And I learn a lot by just studying his work. I've chit-chatted a little bit with him on Instagram, but not much because he has a lot of fans. He does a, a lot of cookbooks. I get a good idea about backgrounds. That's going to be an important part. We're not going to deal with backgrounds here because and it's just going to take too long. Uh, but backgrounds are important for you. Uh, you can pick something that's trashy and painted. You can use a polished wood surface on a table. You can use a mirror. There's a whole variety of them. There's not a, a bad background or a good background, but you have to search for them and try to find some that fit your subject. I'm going to see if I can do some screen sharing right here. Let's give it a try. See what happens. Is it coming up? You're getting a picture of uh, ours? It hasn't yet. Let me see if I need to change something on your. Let me try it. 
Let's see if I'm on screen sharing. Let me try it again. Share screen. Hold All on right. a second. Uh, How about that? I? Let me try this. That should be coming across. Nothing? I'm not seeing it. Gosh, that was okay. working earlier, too. Yeah, well, maybe we won't do screen sharing after all. Hmm. Share screen. Click on it. Share. There we go. Now we got it. Oh, all right. We're good. So these photographs that you see that I have made, all of them were done really simply. This one was done with a flower outside using a flashlight, moving the flashlight around and painting with the light. This one of the lily was done the same way. It was done outside. There were clamps down at the bottom holding it, and it was done by moving a flashlight. This was a flashlight down and low, off to the side. All of these photographs were made very simply in my dining room. This one, foam core on the bottom, foam core at an angle on the top, and one of those work lights coming in from the side, and that's the wall in the background that you see uh, with me that's sort of that red brick color. I try lighting on both sides. This one has lighting on the right, on the left. This is the type of lighting that you use that comes in that's called rim lighting on either side. You use it and uh, it helps you with dimensioning. So I had an ordinary subject, an old doll, which I found for like $1.99 and I tried to think, how can I make it interesting? This one, two flashlights. One is a tungsten bulb, which gives the warm colors, one an LED, cool colors, and then super saturated. This one, the pea plant. In the background, in the same setup that you see behind me, I put a whiteboard and shined a light on the whiteboard so it would mostly turn out white and used Photoshop to clear it. It was tied up with string up at the top. Can you see my little mouse move? Yeah. Maybe not. Okay. Yes, a can. little piece of string was tying that together and then I used, and the string went up to the roof and held it up. This, a flashlight in the back a flashlight in the back, but on a really dirty piece of glass, which is a table outside, which gets filthy. And uh, so I didn't clean it for a long time and then had the flashlight come in from the bottom. This is flowers and petals on a piece of glass with the light coming in from the bottom. Light coming from the back, a flashlight. Now this is one in nature. That happened to be a little ray of sun coming in, but you can see same technique with a flashlight at home as what I got on nature. This, a flashlight behind it, taken outside in the garden. So when I have something like this, which you might've seen, this is just a lily. This was the setup, same sort of work lights, a little vase like you see behind, and maybe you can see that little clip holding the lily up in the vase. And what I have there is the kitchen island, and then I hung uh, some background material on it. And I put it on a chair instead of a table because I decided I would rather sit down while I'm doing this. It seems a whole lot more comfortable to me. So whenever I'm doing a still life, I want to make it a comfortable setting for me. So I tend to have my object put at either a sitting level or a standing level. This, simply putting it on a piece of old paper and then texturing it with Photoshop on a piece of paper, same shot done different ways with Photoshop, but all it was was put on a piece of sort of tan paper and then Photoshop did the rest. I look at food photographers a lot for how they put their backgrounds, how they light it, how they organize their shot. And frankly, I steal from them when I try my own. I tried some of their lighting, I tried some of their textured background and it worked for me. This background, I simply put this doll that I had uh, purchased a long time ago um, in front of my computer and had a video running in the background of just junk. So you can use your monitor as a background in some of these still shots. This one was taken at the um, Iris Farm just north of Salem and 
Carol held the gray board in the background and I held a whiteboard underneath to give, give a little highlight underneath the stem. And that's all that was. I got a lot of photographs there. So anything that I'm describing and showing, that's what I do. I don't use any of the fancy equipment to make that happen. We're back? Yep. Yep. Okay. So let me show you some of the things that I use. Now you're going to have to tell me because I won't be able to see the screen. I switched over to the spot or to the uh, overview. All right. So it's common for me to use, is this showing the science fair background? Yes, it is. Yeah. I use science fair background board because it'll stay up all by itself. And I can use the wings to separate out some of the light and close it off. I want to see it. I don't want to see it. See how it shadows the background? So I really like science fair board backgrounds a lot. The other is regular foam cord. And I um, put black paint on it and then scrape it. Now in doing this background, sometimes I use it straight. Sometimes I move it in relationship to the camera so it turns out more blurry, more in focus. But more often than not, when I'm making the photograph, it's at a very long exposure. And when I have that long exposure, something you can do with your background is move it. And if you move it, then you get some really interesting textures and looks and association with it. Sometimes I take it back and forth. Your only key is that you have to be careful if you have something that's delicate that you're not going to fan it and cause it to move. But I'll have exposures commonly that are like 10 or 15 seconds. And it's very common for me to move a board in the background. It softens it up. I don't have to worry as much about depth of field. And I get some nice looks to it. I recommend on another board that you get one and you put some holes in it. This was cut for specific shapes of light to fall on the subject. So I can put this on the front of a light source. And as I move it closer to the object, the light coming through looks bigger on the object. And as I move it closer to the light, that little spotlight is a way it, it creates a spotlight for me. I could, and I have done this for commercial shots, I will cut lines in here and put it up on the light and it looks like it's the light coming in from a window from Venetian blinds or something like that. The idea is that with foam core board, you can paint it, you can poke holes in it, it doesn't have to be anything sacrosanct. It can be something that allows you to manipulate and change. I bend them, break them, tear them. I've taken pieces and because I wanted a rough edge, I have actually torn edges of it. Another thing, I use sheets of paper for background. Go to an art supply store. This just happens to be parchment. I have some with flowers. I have some with different colors. I either move them or hold them still. So your background is not something that you have to deal with with just a wall in your house, but some really expensive items that can help you get an interesting background. All right, any questions so far? We have not seen any yet. Okay, well, that's, uh, I must be either boring or doing a bang up job. No, you're doing great. Great job. Bang up job. Woohoo! All right, things that I frequently use when I'm making a little still life. I commonly use a cutting blade to help me shape and cut things. You saw the photograph of the peas. Well, I trimmed those up and then I fixed those little trimming spots using Photoshop. It's a very common tool for me to use this. I also use tweezers because my fingers are too big and clumsy for a lot of these things. And importantly, I use a lot of cleaning tools. If you look at the shot of the flower right now in the vase. That's my hint. Uh -huh, that's your hint. Go, there we go. Okay. Okay. It's, it's filthy. You'd go crazy in Photoshop. The tabletop is filthy. It requires just an extraordinary level of attention to detail to get a really nice shot in get rid of all of that junk. Uh, look at the vase itself and the water in the vase. Me, 
I think that needs to be filled all the way up. Take a look at the dust and the dirt. A lot of work needed to go into this. And look at the flower. Is that the best flower I've got? Is it in the right position? So you want to spend a lot of time before you actually start shooting to be certain that the whole setup is looking good. Um, professional photographers, when they do this, cleaning is a major effort. Everybody goes around with white gloves on. Um, you look for hairs that might have fallen down when you're leaning over. I had to redo a commercial shoot. cost me a lot of money because I just didn't dust it well enough. This is before Photoshop could do that so easily. All right, so let's try some stuff. Making sure I've covered it. All right, the small flashlight. I mentioned in those sample photographs that the small flashlight was used in a lot of these photos. So I'm gonna turn off this overview, this soft light. And let's go to the um, overview. I think okay. that'll probably do its best. And we're there. Okay. Let me take a look and see if my hand's in the right place. Oh, good. All right. So the light is always going to be facing towards the subject. And I will take a long exposure. And if I want to have a sharp light, I make sure I don't touch the table because it will shake. I will have a side light coming in and it will be very sharp. But if I move this during that long exposure, it's going to be like a soft box. It'll, it'll look gorgeous that way. I can have my soft box on the top. I can have my soft box on the bottom. The only key I've got to look for, however, is the reflections that come in off of uh, reflective surfaces. Reflective surfaces take a little effort to get wet. Now see how dirty that is? Ooh. Reflective surfaces you have to be careful about. So back to me. So when you're dealing with reflective surfaces, you want to usually have a broader light source like I have re off the board here. Then it tends to give you some nice lines and nice shapes on the uh, reflective surface. And in doing that, uh, it usually makes your job easier. Then I might take the flashlight and might decide, well, I think maybe I want a little bit coming in on the bottom. Maybe I want it coming in from somewhere else. And I might add a little of the flashlight to the shot. Any questions? So we got one here from uh, Madeline. Oh, it's not a question, it's just a statement. Uh, of fact. It's my kind of photography. This is brilliant, she says. So, oh, thanks. So at least one wife, person likes I'm going to tell work. my wife that somebody said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're good. All right, good. Um, this little flashlight is uh, LED, which means it has a cooler color. I also have a little flash like this, flashlight like this, which is a tungsten light. If I put tungsten moving on one side and LED on the other, then I'm gonna get colder and warmer colors. And I like that color uh, push of warmer and, color, warmer and colder colors. They're not gonna be vivid until you slide it way over on Photoshop, but it does give you some delightful effects when you decide to use those two different colors. I might also take another flashlight and the putty or a clamp and I will use it and shine it on the background to create a spotlight or, and I can adjust that light to where I want it. Let's say, see here with the highlight on the flower? Let me turn this uh, overview off. And that lets me adjust my background. The further I put it back, the less likely it is, is to affect my shot. So, I may even put it underneath the table. That's a common place to put it, is to have it to come from underneath. I'm not gonna climb underneath the table tonight, but you get the idea that having that flashlight, the further you move it back, the bigger it becomes. It gives you a lot of nice control. And I do the same thing I do on other lights. If I'm not mounting it permanently, I will move it so it becomes soft. 
I'm big on painting with light, like Carol does, and using it without the light shining into the camera. So let's get this out of frame. And you can see how you can make that adjustment. Now, I also used a, you've got the board, which you can see in the overview. I'm gonna take that board down and show you other ways to use that board. And remove the stand so I don't knock too many things over. Okay, Greg, could you go to the flower view? Yep. All right. So I can, by moving this board, and I often hold the light in my hand. Let's see if I can pull that off. I uh, can't seem to make it work on my own here. I'm trying to see this backwards. All right, well, maybe just go to the overview and I can demonstrate it because I can't, can't quite decipher it on my own. Can you all see what I'm doing here? I shine the light up at the board and that will give me overhead light. And I may move these and I create a soft light effect that way. If I tilt it down, you see how I'm having less light on the background? If I tilt it down, then I can keep my dark background in the shot. I keep moving it, it's gonna be a soft light. I lift this up and I'm adding illumination to the background. This light, I oftentimes will put it like on a box or something else to save me from grief and some trouble of having to do this. And I will take a piece of cardboard and put it on the side of this light. <coughs> on the side of the light, so it won't shine on my background. Something like that. Same light, same boards. So I have this light reflecting off the board to give me a soft overhead light or off to the side. I have had it come down from the bottom. Let's see if I can demonstrate that. I have it coming from the bottom to give me a type of light. I don't know how that looks uh, for this particular still life, but I put it down low and bounce it off. So bouncing it off of this one whiteboard gives me a whole variety of different types of light to work with. Now direct light. Let's see how this is looking. May I see the little flower? All right. Direct, direct light's another creature. With direct light, everything looks much harsher. The shadows are bolder. And so you have some choices with direct light. If you use a white background, those shadows are really gonna pop against the contrast with the white background. On the other hand, if you use a dark background, then the lighted portion of your flower is really gonna pop. Oh, I wish I could adjust the exposure on my uh, cell phone, I can't. It's not getting a good exposure, this needs to be toned way down so everything looks back. But I think you get the idea. A dark background accentuates your highlights and a light background accentuates your shadows. Still, just foam core. Still the types of things that you have around the house. All right, let me put up my science fair project. All right, my science fair project board allows me to do all kinds of fun things with the light by folding those leaves of the board. See how I created a shadow pattern in the back? Now, if the camera was lower, 
and the object was on a, a different surface, you could get more to play with. But these boards just in themselves allow you a great deal of control and play by folding them from one place to the other. I can decide I want to split the light, shadow it. I can have it just barely come across the flower all by controlling and then open it up this leaf. So if you use one of these science fair project boards that you might have had when you were in school and you decide you want to get one that's in black or one that's in white, I happen to have pulled the color one. Imagine the control you could have on a black and white photograph by doing this with your light. That, that's an expensive piece of equipment to get barn doors on a big light. If you went to the camera store. But this is not an expensive piece of equipment. And you can achieve much the same result. So I could get this just right. I could decide I wanted to move my light, make it into a softer light. These shadows would be softer. But this tool right here, I like it a lot. I may take two backgrounds and put them together. See if I can give you an idea. So I can get, let's say, a black science fair folding board, help me control how the light is going to hit, and then insert a different background just for the flower. Could we see what the flower is looking like? Uh, sort of. Exposure stinks, but I think you can get the idea from what we've got there on how it could look. Any questions? Yeah, uh, John Hayek was wanting to know what your go-to lens is for this type of photography. Okay, he's, he's asking what's coming up soon, so that's really good. Nice work, thanks. <laughs> um, the lens that I use is uh, um, uh, a lens that's at least 60 or um, 80 millimeter. I like it for a variety of reasons. I like it because um, it will help me diffuse the background more and it keeps me out of reflections. So the light's not shining on me. When I'm making photographs and I have to work on a tabletop, um, if I'm wearing white, I'm gonna likely reflect light and show up in the picture. Yeah, so I tend to wear black and dark shapes. Then, that way, I'm less likely to be in the photo. So I want to be back a little bit, not only so I can control the depth of field and I like the perspective, but also so that I'm out of the um, lighting design so I don't show up in the picture itself. When I do make a photograph and it's a reflective surface like we have here, I get everything that I think is just perfect. It's exposure, the whole shoot and match. And then I look in the back of my camera and I enlarge it as much as I can. And I go around all those little places and look for dust, dirt. Do I get to see myself? Am I seeing the camera? Are they things that I could easily Photoshop out? Or are they things that I need to fix when I'm doing the setup? But that really close look in the back of the camera, when you think you've got everything just right, can save you a lot of grief. I have, I have made innumerable mistakes by not doing that well enough and going back. And sometimes just getting exasperated because it was such a, a tedious setup for an object and then go, nah, it's just not worth it. If somebody was paying me a lot of money, I'd go back. Nah. So I try to do it right the first time by taking that, um, that time to look and see if it's good. Then I, I bracket like a madman because I never know what's going to be the best exposure. So when I'm making it, I may grossly overexpose and say, is it going to look good if I blow things out? Well, I like that halo. Even if it looks extreme, maybe I can combine it using Photoshop with another one. I also go way down and go very dark so that maybe just the highlights are showing. I showed you the purple lily. That was severely underexposed. That lily wasn't that color. It wasn't that dark. It was much more vibrant. But I liked how it was on the darker exposure. I liked that it showed the little rim of the lily. And that was happenstance. I had the standard exposure. Then I go up and down all the way three plus and three minus at half stop intervals to be certain I have uh, uh, opportunity to experiment. I may combine images. If, I've, if it's uh, not too difficult, I'm not a wizard at it, 
I'll combine a lot of images to try to get the end result. Anything? Looking at my time. Um, I'm looking on what to minimize here since it's eight o'clock. I think we're doing good, Britt. Okay, well, I'm, I just was, uh, I thought the goal was try to be done at eight. Well, that was I'm trying with us starting at seven, so. Oh. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we're, we're uh, I'm not sure, it's close to my bedtime, but uh, okay. I can stay well, a little I'll bit keep later, going. so yes, please do. <laughs> All right. This is a book that uh, you might give, which we do, your grandchildren to play with. It has all different types of colored paper. I like these because not only could I use the black pieces to cut out and make something to block a little section of light or to put around the flashlight or any place where I want to deny light. But when I have a small tabletop like this, I can get these large sheets and I can come up with any color I want. And if I have a, you know, a slightly long lens and the right aperture, I can get rid of all this paper texture and just come up with a solid color. And whenever I'm doing that, I just use painter's tape and tape it to the wall. I use painter's tape a lot in taping things to the wall. It's what I told you was up in the ceiling right now, a little piece of painter's tape. My granddaughter came in, first thing she's, not the first, after the greeting, she looked around the house and said, Granddad, why do you have tape on the roof? I said, well, on the ceiling, oh, I forgot to take it down, and there was a thread coming down. She thought maybe it was a spider that had put that up there. Um, so when I'm doing my work, uh, I would say my two primary tools are the tape and this flashlight and all the others just help me along or tools other than, you know, the background and the subject itself, but the working tools, I use those a lot. All right. I think I kind of zipped through it. Anything else you'd like to know? Let me, uh, open this up for everybody then. So you, you, that was again your presentation, is that correct? As far as what you had prepared? Yeah. Well, okay. you know, I'm kind of fast, to... but yeah. Like I said, I tried to make it at eight. No, you did have a comment from one viewer who said she will stay on as long as you want to talk. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> I, I, I think that's true for sons. several of us. We're, it's okay. been great. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, folks, go ahead and unmute yourself, but uh, now is kind of a time to visit with Britt and ask any questions that uh, we didn't get in here already. Uh, it looks like Carol's got a yeah. question though. When okay. shooting flowers, do you have to stack focus? I, I don't um, because I'm not that close. So I can use a reasonable aperture and get the photographs from front to back. Um, and there's a photograph, oh, I didn't put it up, but if you look on my Facebook page, there's a chrysanthemum. And that chrysanthemum uh, <laughs> intentionally goes soft out on the periphery. So I Say made- that three times real fast. <laughs> it, and so I actually made a photograph where it was sharp front to back and I made some that were soft. And instead of stacking, I layered it because I liked the idea that it moved towards something that was not quite as, as brilliant as the center. And so um, I tend to photograph things that are flatter. But I tend not to stack. I could, but it's just not how I see the world. All right, I'm gonna go back and see if I can get screen sharing again. And go back here some. All right, so now that you have that information, I showed you a blackboard with texture painted on it. That is that same blackboard moving so that you don't see the details of that texture. If you look kind of at the bottom where you see some tears, I don't know if you can pick that up, but those tears were intentionally put there on the board because I wanted that little texture at the bottom. So this photograph was done with light painting where the board was above 
the lily, the aged lily. It was above the lily. I moved the board. I had put my uh, light fixed and I moved the board. This sounds like I'm ambidextrous and I am. I moved the board at the top to give a softer light and I moved the background board at the same time to get that soft background. I also used a little teeny pair of scissors because there was more than one of those little guys sticking up and I wanted to trim it off. Then on this one, this was suspended by a thread going up to the ceiling. Same spot where I have showed you tonight, but there was absolutely no light shining on the background. So this object, these tulips were moved up forward on a, a table much further into the room so that no light at all would shine on the background. So I didn't need to have a black background. Then I had two different colors of tulips. I believe that one that you see as the bright one was yellow and I don't remember the color of the other ones because I knew in Photoshop I could go and I could change the values for those colors and decide what I wanted them to be to bring out that one tulip. As a color photograph, it stunk. But as a black and white, it looked good. This photograph, these photographs, the one that you see on the left has direct light coming in on the on the left side, but not as bright and direct light coming in more on the right hand side. And then the background is cheating. I got textures on Photoshop. This Chris. one, however, is just a straight photograph. I picked up a rock out of the garden. And as I was dealing with the black board to stop light, as I tilted it, I thought, I like that. So that board is leaning against the same wall that you see behind me. And it's held in place with that same putty, just up on the little corner that was touching the wall, this same poster putty to hold it in place. Then when I got that set up, I began moving that same work light that you see behind me, moving it around till I liked the way it looked. And I put the stone and I moved the stone back and forth to see what I could find. And then I was just delighted and surprised to see that light that came into the shadow, almost as if that stone was reflecting. So that's a single light that made that photo. I love hey, it. Bert. Yeah. I think we had, uh, we had somebody who was going to ask a question. Was that Sharon that I hear? Yeah. Um, if you're holding a flashlight in one hand and a board or something else in another hand, how do you take the shot? Timer. All my shots are on timer. Okay. Good question. Uh, it's something I wish I'd thought of. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah. I always use a timer so that everything is stable because my <coughs> exposures are so very long. So I have the self timer set on 10 seconds. Oh. Sometimes I use the remote. Sometimes I press the button if I'm really close. So I wait for 10 seconds. It blinks. It gives me time to get everything set up. All right. I'm going to be moving the background. I'm going to be doing this. And it gives me time to do it. Okay. Part of the reason I really enjoy the light painting is because I can go through a lot of experiments. I can go through a variety of experiments, find out which light I like best. Do I want to swing it around, get it on the bottom? Do I want the top? Do I want to concentrate on some area in the center? What am I doing with the background? I'll just deal with the flashlight here. And I can experiment. Then when I go back and I look at them and I find the one I like best, then I go back and I take those various bracketing exposures using that same technique. Okay. But I spend, I make a lot of photographs that way. And they're always on a timer. Okay, good. All right, I have a question. And how did you get in the, in the image with the rock? What's forming the angles in the foreground? Uh, let's go back to the image of the rock. Let me put on uh, sharing again. Okay, now I'm looking at it. Could you ask it again? The angles in the foreground. Mm -hmm. What's, how did you create, if, if the rock is on a table and the black, the dark black is your held in place foam core, where are the angles in the front coming from that are so oblique? That is another piece of board that okay. created that shadow. 
Okay. Yep. And I used Photoshop to make it sharper. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because um, you can see that um, um, the sharpness fades off as it gets further away. But mm -hmm. I wanted the whole thing sharp. But it is another piece of board. Good okay. question. Uh, this is a wonderful image, Britt. I love all the leading lines and uh, oh, yeah. the angles. It's, it's just wonderful. And the Thank triangles. You. That's a that's a discovery. That comes from sitting at the table and fiddling. And as I was fiddling, that's where I saw the angle of the board. There was no um, uh, planning ahead on that. I knew that I was going to use the rock. And I knew I was going to use the boards and I knew I was going to use a light because I didn't want to mess with anything else. I just wanted to be simple and easy. And so I started moving things around and there's a lot of failures, but then I had this and I, I was very satisfied with it too. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for adding that there are a lot of failures. Always good for us to know. <laughs> oh, so many. Oh, so many. My gosh. Let me, um, if you haven't failed, this, you haven't tried. That lighting, uh, to get it so there was texture on the highlights and still have enough light on the doll. I was moving back and forth, softer, lighter, light, harder, light, trying to go back and forth to find what I wanted. I didn't worry about the base because I figured I can Photoshop that, but I knew I didn't have the skill level to do all that uh, unless, excuse me, unless I pretty much had it on the, on the mark. And this is well in front of that wall that I have behind me. So you don't see much of that texture mm -hmm. and the narrower depth of focus on it so that the doll and the base are sharp and the background is out. And is this doll held up by string by your thread? Is that how the arms are held in the, how is this? Well, it would be, you see, I wanted to have something that would, uh, uh, add some punch to the doll picture. And so that's when I thought, well, I'm gonna just tie its little arms up. <laughs> and then I got- Bond Doll bondage. Yeah, just, you know, <laughs> just, just, to, just to get people going, huh? Creepy. Uh, yeah, I like it. Um, but I got really lucky on this one. It stood up like that all by its little self. Oh, wow. No. <laughs> really? Yeah, I know, I, I was shocked. I, I was ready with the putty, I was even ready I will put nails in things. I will take, let's say, a flower stem and and, uh, and put a little skewer up inside of it. Uh, I'll use needles to hold things. You know, nothing is, is sacrosanct as mm -hmm. long as I don't see those things in the photo. So, yeah, I, I was ready to do dirt to this guy. Yeah, did it start moving around after you let it go? <laughs> it, it began to cry and weep. That's what, what I thought. <laughs> Yeah. We, do, you ever add natural, do you ever add natural light at all to anything um, or only artificial light? I have, let's see if I have that one. Did I not draw that up? Oh, here. This one is natural light. This is a white board and a black board and the same little vase and a garlic flower and this light coming in oh. through our gate. Oh, wow. That's all oh. it is. And then I spent a lot of time getting that uh, lined up just right. And it didn't quite come out as straight as I wanted. So I used Photoshop to make a sharper line out of it and to get it a little bit straighter. But that's, that's what that one is. That's available light. I don't think this one's available light. No, this I is like just put in inside like of a, um, old beat up decorative wheelbarrow mm -hmm. and uh, a pear we picked off of the neighbor's tree. We have a lot of, uh, uh, fruit trees around here. It used to be a fruit orchard in our neighborhood. So we have some urban harvesting we can do. So I picked that off. I like the dried leaves that were on it and I set it in the corner and that is just a natural light. Um, after direct sunlight had left our patio, but I still had question? plenty of skylight. If you had natural light on that, how did you get light coming in from more than one mm -hmm. direction? Because I still had skylight, the setting sun sky. Oh, okay. Yep. And so I just adjusted that little uh, beat up old decorative wheelbarrow. That's what it was. Yep. Until it looked good. 
And then again, I took a bazillion exposures to see what it would look like. I tried bringing in some cardboard to use a reflector. You can see the highlight at the top of the pear by the leaf. Mm -hmm. It did that all by itself. I've, I've been known to, uh, don't tell anybody out loud, but to take just a little spit and rub it on something to get a little moisture and get a little, a little sweet spot, a little highlight on something. Uh, yeah, you got to be ready and quick because it dries out. Uh, one of the things that you, you use uh, in commercial photography is some glycerin and it won't dry up. But yeah, I have more than one occasion just, just a little, that's all, just to get that little better highlight. But I didn't, this didn't require any of that. It was fortunate for the light, uh, but I, I moved it around. It was in that wheelbarrow and I moved it around. And then my challenge was uh, to find uh, chairs and junk to make sure that that wheelbarrow still stayed right in that spot to go with notice, the light. Do you notice that when you're using natural light like that, that the colors flow into each other mm -hmm. in a more natural fashion than when you're using artificial light? Um, well, you know, I wish I had a good answer for that. I'm colorblind. Oh, well, I didn't necessarily mean color, as I should have said density. Oh, the density. Oh, yeah, I, well, what I, I like with this, what I, I like really... about this is that the the softer light really opens up the shadows, gives a, a nice softness to everything. It, um, as a color, the colors didn't look very good, but I, I enjoy that light that uh, once the sun disappears behind the gate in our courtyard, I've tried using that light before. Yeah. Um, this one was that same black background I showed you with the textures on it and just this, um, a long neck squash that I liked in the grocery store because of the stem. So it simply set down there and it's put on the um, floor, the tile floor there in our courtyard. Again, the light is not directly shining on that. And I don't have any reflector. I just set it on that board. Hmm. The thing I like about this bird is it's a really good study in light. Right. Well, thank it's you. Just a great way to learn. That's why I use it, like that doll. Yeah. That was a study because I have a woman who's a weightlifter and when COVID's over, uh, we want to make photographs together and I wanted to learn the technique of dimensioning. And so I used that doll for practice with the light coming in on the side and how to get that to work. I now know how to scale that up. Of course, I won't use a flashlight, but I learned how to scale it up. This shot, that came from uh, deciding that I really liked overexposure better. And it's the same thing. I don't remember the name of the folks that have the iris field up there in the north. Um, going around, Carol uh, was holding up the blackboard. I made the photograph and I liked it better with more contrast and changing the exposure. So I'm not committed to any one type of thing, whereas this one is just perfectly normal. That's just a, a straight shot uh, with the board moving in the background because I didn't want any board texture on it. I do that a lot for long exposures and I bring a tripod to do this. And then I, when I'm doing places like this, I, I hope like crazy there's no wind. Otherwise I'm out of luck. When you're using lights like that, do you think ahead of time about creating dimension and creating depth of field at the same time? Well, for me, um, the sense of dimension in 3D comes from the quality of the light. And in this case, I'm oh, sorry, I remember there's two boards here. I forgot. There's the gray background board and, um, and it was a diffuse light situation. And then there's a white board underneath it to get that little highlight you see underneath there to give okay. some dimension to the overall piece and to the um, edges of that flower. Now, I don't see a whole lot whoop. of depth of field. I'm and sorry, that's... pardon? I wondered why like in the pair, you had a wonderful depth of field. I mean, it was like three dimensional. And yet here you have the same basic color tones and the depth of field isn't nearly as defined as it was in the pair. Mm -hmm. So I wondered what the difference was in what you did. 
All right, I'm comparing it to which image so I can go back to it? Hmm. The pear and the wheelbarrow. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. I got you. All right. And had great depth of field. Right, this one, it has a, a more of a 3D sense. This one, the light is much more diffuse. Yeah. And when the light is much more diffuse and tend to be coming from all directions at once, you don't get any dimensioning in something like that. Okay. On the other hand, if the lighting is more directional, and you get strong shadows, then you get a much stronger dimensioning. If you look at that leaf on the left-hand side folded down, right. that nice, rich, dark shadow and the soft shadows underneath the belly of the pear, those give a strong three-dimensional feeling because that's very strongly directional light. That is a on the other hand, uh, this light is much more diffuse. It is uh, with the diffuse lighting, which was naturally there, and then with a the white reflector coming from the bottom, uh, the petals themselves have very little direction to the light. And so that's why the difference, if I'm understanding your question. Yeah, yeah. okay. The lack of shadows too, the lack of shadows. Rick, yep. do you have a website? I have an Instagram site. Okay. And it's it under is, your uh, name? Well, here, let's see if I can go to uh, find that chat window. Here, well, let me finish this one, then I'll come back. Okay. And, and just I do a lot of experimenting. That. Pardon? While you're doing that, Britt, I'm just going to remind everybody, I will be uh, putting this video together and posting it to our uh, uh, YouTube page, and there'll be links for it in our Facebook and also our meetup page. But uh, Helpful, thank you. I will put uh, links for all of Britt's uh, contacts and his uh, Instagram site and, and anything else Great. that he wants in there. Thank okay. you, Greg. So there's my doll with the arms still tied behind it. And then there's the arms from a doll that used to scare Carol as a little girl when she'd go in and see that doll in the closet. That's horrible. And it had fallen apart. And so I just took the arms and again, experimenting, trying to find something uh, to pique people's interest. So I tore the paper, I wrinkled the paper and I set it on there. And the periphery is done by, uh, taking a collodion wet plate, um, blank collodion wet plate image, which you can find online that you just want to have um, that glass piece. And so it was a, a, a layer of that on the top and then the doll picture on the bottom. And then I decided how much uh, see-through I wanted on that collodion wet plate layer on the top. And I wanted a lot of that around the periphery. And then I erased a lot of that in the middle so that the middle of the image was sharp and the outside began to fall apart. So that's not an in-camera shot, uh, a straight in-camera shot. Torn paper, the folding, the direct light coming in, uh, the same light that you've seen, that uh, same work light that comes from the garage was used to provide that light. Then, because it's black and white, I used the values where I said, all right, I want the reds to be darker. Well, because this doll has skin tones, if I decided I wanted the reds to be darker on my black and white, then that made the doll not look so sweet and baby. Instead, it had uh, a little un uncomfortable look to it, and it contrasted more with the uh, body. And then the body itself, I reached underneath that little outfit, and I put stuffing underneath there. <laughs> And the goal was, again, to make people go, oh, my gosh, what's wrong with him? It worked. It worked. Yeah. Yeah, it works. Those shots, those shots get, uh, get quite a bit of attention, so I like it. It's hideous. <laughs> what in the world is wrong with that man? <laughs> like, you know, those are the types of things that I like. It makes me feel like I did something successful. Okay, this would be the last one. Oh, I love that. Um, this one, um, it was an LED light and um, I used the texture on Photoshop to increase what appears to be the sharpness and the texture in association with this one. I must have made 30 different shots with the flashlight, directly behind it, up and behind, all the way around two flashlights. I can't honestly remember whether I did one or two here. 
but I did have two flashlights that I was looking. But I carefully took a pair of tweezers and picked all of those little puffy pieces off the front of that. Oh. One little puffy piece at a time and afraid that I might wave it or sneeze or shake it <laughs> and, and, and lose my model. But that was a, that was a tedious shot and I, I felt blessed that one of them turned out. Yeah. It's and by removing the front, that means I didn't need as much depth of focus to go all the way from the front of the puffball. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea of the reveal since I'd seen so many puffball pictures. I thought, well, what if I just have a half? It's astounding. That's lovely. All right, I've gone a half an hour over. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for You're doing right. that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, You're welcome. So Good much. folks. I, uh, I can't um, adequately express the feelings I have about being able to at least see you all on video through a Zoom. In times of isolation, to have that contact as a delight, people that I know, friends and, and new friends that I don't know, to reconnect with the group, um, to know that you all are still there and well, this has been a joy for me. I appreciate the opportunity very much. Thank you. We do too. Thank you, too. Thank you Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Brett. It was excellent. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. And perfect photography for being at home. <laughs> yeah, that's the goal. I'm glad, I'm glad you went back to that opening statement. Can this be easy to do at home? I, I hope you give it a shot because you don't need much. Well, one of my things as a photographer, as a friend of mine says, I'm a photographer, not a mule. So I'm a lazy photographer. I don't like to go out and carry <laughs> stuff. So I yeah. do a lot of tabletop photography here. Oh, um, good. I've worked with ice cubes moving along a table and all sorts of weird, you know, mannequins and ice cubes. And I don't do a lot of flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I have to go get some dolls. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> see if I can uh, utilize. Goodwill and Saint Vinny's are great for broken dolls. What was that? And they're so cheap. Saint Vincent's and Goodwill oh, and those. Good idea. You know, I I will take the dolls and I'll go. If I break it. Oh, great. I think this would be a good broken doll. Yeah, I've go. taken a porcelain doll and actually broken it. You can see that on my Instagram page. You look around, you'll see a broken doll. I like the, I took the eyeballs out. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. Seems like something from the latest Perry Mason show. Well, <laughs> oh, you know, so I've got a lot of shots with those eyeballs floating all around the background. I can find yep. it just the right one. And actually, I did a month of white tulips a couple of years ago. That's all I shot. Ooh at home, tabletop and floorboards and whatever, but thank you. So this re you're welcome. really ran. Well, if you're, if you're on Facebook, I'd appreciate all you all to, if, you know, if you have a, a page of your photos, put a link up there. I'd love to go look. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Britt. Um, you're welcome. Just a reminder for everybody, I'll be posting this video once I've uh, got it into an editable uh, piece. We'll include links that uh, Britt shares with me and I'll let you know when that gets posted. Uh, coming up, we've got uh, next week, this uh, 6.30 next week on Wednesday is photo critique. So uh, please, if you can, jump in. Hopefully we won't have any Zoom problems. Uh, but uh, yeah, I hope everybody has a, a great evening. Thank you for hanging in there with us. Uh, sorry for the little delay getting things started, but uh, uh, you, guys are, you guys are the best and uh, we just really appreciate uh, having you here. So anyway, hope everybody stays uh, safe. Uh, safe drive home or whatever you're doing. Uh, and <laughs> we will we and will see you. We will see you soon. So you all take care. Have a good night. Hey, Tracy, before you go. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.